stay tuned everyone we're about to begin so stay tuned we're about to begin
Good evening, everyone. We are about to begin. <laughs> All right. Um, it is really so very good to be able to spend this evening with everyone again. I do apologize for the few minutes that we went over in terms of being able to start but we should be able to get everybody squared away in short order um, so let me just say good night to a few persons good night Dolores good night Heather Good night, Diana. And good night to the Russells. It is, it is good to spend a little time interacting with my people. Now, um, just let me turn down this music a little bit first because I don't want it to interact interfere too much with what we were saying um, I hope that level is good I'll turn it off here in a short while but if it's a little bit too loud or I'm not sure I can't really hear it myself but um you let me know okay if it's if it's okay where it is you let me know if it's too loud still the background music we are going to be turning it off in a very short um <clears throat> in a short while now i just want to point out a few things um first of all first off you know there was a news report that came out yesterday evening in fact that somebody who shared my name had passed away in a tragic accident and I just want to let everyone know that obviously it was not me um, but our our prayers are with the family of that other Neil Gardner um, at this time it must have been I mean car accidents are always such a tragic loss so sudden one minute your loved one is with you and the next minute they are no more so we want to just offer our condolences to that family but suffice it to say that um i'm very much here and so we're grateful for that if you guys are hearing me okay i'm gonna ask that you comment if you're not hearing me um let me know because i want to get some confirmation that I'm being heard clearly and that the audio level is good so that I can go ahead and get started so let me turn off the other audio so I'm waiting for somebody to type in that whether they are hearing me or not. Good evening, all hearing loud and clear. Thank you, Debbie. And good evening, Debbie. Glad you could have joined us today. And I will say big up. All right. So there is a slight delay between when hey <laughs> between when I actually say something and when you will receive it or hear it online um, I don't think I can change it to make it happen any quicker but right now it looks like it's about at about a 10 second delay so just bear that in mind if you hear a question being asked just understand that I already asked it um, there are no giveaways, so you don't have to worry about competing with somebody else who might hear it earlier. So that being said, I want to just point out a couple of things here so you guys can um, pay attention. Now, we do have a...
we do have a handout that goes with this particular um, class and to complete that handout or to, to it's not a completed that handout it's really just you can just scan it if you have a QR code reader on your cell phone you can just simply take a snap of this QR code and you shall see you will be able to download or you will have it appear on your phones the um, the handle that goes to this class so it will help you to stay abreast of what we're discussing so please go ahead and let me give you a moment if you do not have a QR code reader that's QR code reader you may download one on Google store Google Play stores or um, the Apple Play Store if you have an Apple phone and that you'll be able to use that now to to scan this image and you should see the you should see the handout appearing now if you do not have that then what you can then do instead is simply um, type in this long lengthy thing in your URL in your you know in Google or in your Google Chrome your um, Microsoft Edge whatever browser you're using Safari whatever browser you're using you can just download this information put down write down this information type it into your browser as is and you can it will be taking it will take you to the download page of our handout so I'll just give a couple more seconds for that All right, <clears throat> so enough said. This is what the handout will look like, but it is actually a completed handout, so you should be good to go. So the topic for this evening is the seven keys to getting and staying well. The seven keys to getting and staying well. So tell secret, tell Tracy your secret. So I assume that your name is Tracy from the UK. Welcome, Tracy. I'm not sure if you're associated with our practice or not, but you are certainly most welcome to participate with us this evening. Or in your case, this very early morning so welcome to you all welcome 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 all right so back to the basics right the of the seven keys we're going to discuss them sequentially and it is my hope or the goal of this presentation is to ensure that you understand enough so that you can make intelligent decisions as it relates to your health. Whether or not that decision involves you, um, you know, becoming a member of our team, our practice, it doesn't really matter to me as long as you make a choice that is in your best interest and no one takes advantage of you or forces you into a decision that benefits them and not you. I love win-win relationships. I love it when I am able to be in a relationship with somebody and they get something out of it and I get something out of it. And so we both are winners. 
and nobody wins at the expense of the other. And so this is what I'm trying to, um, you know, hopefully impart here tonight. Some way of being able to understand enough so you can make wise choices. So here we go. Key number one, and if anyone misunderstands or don't understand something, I'm going to invite you to just make your comment in the chat section indicating if you don't understand something so that I can try to go over it. I'll try to periodically glance at the chats, um, the chat section, and some people just love to see their, their, their names appear, and so they just type in things just to see their names, but don't be that guy, or don't be that person, right? If you have a legitimate question that you'd like to have me address, please feel free to raise it. So, let us begin, shall we? Of the seven keys, the first is the simplest. It is, but it's probably the most important because it sets up everything else. It is sick care versus health care and an appreciation of what the difference between the two is. Now, please understand when we're talking about the healthcare system, the healthcare system is not the healthcare system is not focused, and despite I'm gonna say something that's slightly controversial, I guess, to some people. Um, but hopefully you'll understand where I'm coming from, right? But the healthcare system is not a system that's focused on ensuring that people achieve or obtain optimal health. That is not the focus of the healthcare system. That is what we would like to think it does, but that's not the focus of the system. If that were the focus of the system, then a lot more healthy people would, one, participate in the system, and two, get benefits from the system. But you will find that the primary person who accesses the healthcare system is somebody who is already sick or somebody who is already diseased. And to suggest that we need to promote health services to more healthy people so that more healthy people will seek out the healthcare system um, earlier is probably not going to work because the people who are in charge of, responsible for, or are involved in managing the health of the individuals are poorly trained as it relates to optimizing health. I don't say this as an insult to any physician. It is just how it is as, a, as a, insofar as the, their training in med school is concerned. What do I mean by that? And how do I justify what I just said? And please don't check out because I said that. What we know is that Medications can only be applied when somebody has some kind of a malady, a disease of some kind. Medical doctors are trained to prescribe medications. So their principal tool of helping someone, if it's medications, means that they're only able to help somebody who is already sick. That's the first thing. Secondly, if there's a surgical procedure that needs to be done, of which medical doctors, many of whom are trained surgeons, you only perform surgeries on those who are sick for some reason or the other. You do not perform surgeries and you do not prescribe medication for people who are already healthy. You do it for people who are sick. And so what we recognize from this is that Persons probably are misusing the system. A lot of people get, I, I've spent time with patients who come here and they're frustrated. They say that they go to their medical doctor and they want to be healthy. They want to get nutritional advice. They don't want to get medication, but yet still that's what they are prescribed. They're prescribed medications. And I'm just gonna say, say it this way. 
if somebody goes to an electrician for a problem, the, electri the electrician is going to be checking your wires. That's what their training entitles them to do. If it's somebody that has a plumbing requirement and they go to a plumber, they're going to check your pipes. If you go to a medical doctor, they're going to check your system and see how they can apply what they learned. What did they learn? They learned how to prescribe medications appropriately, and they learned how to perform different types of surgical procedures and, and the like. And so, please, that's, the, that's where I'm coming from. It's not an insult to them because the system is very good at what it's designed to do. And what is it designed to do? The medical system, the healthcare system, as we understand it, is designed to optimize, to, sorry, not to optimize health, but to ease suffering or to save lives. Those are the two principal foci or focuses of the healthcare system, to ease suffering or to save lives. So if you're in a life-threatening event, a car accident, had a terrible fall, you need to probably go to the emergency room and have the medical doctors take care of you because that's where their training shines far superior over every other person in any of the allied health services. If you have something like a gunshot wound, you need to get surgeries to save your life, what have you, heart attack, what have you. But if it is that you want nutritional recommendations, if it is that you want to know how to eat or live in a way to prevent yourself from getting sick, then that's where there is now a limitation in the training of your medical professional. And then you may need to pursue advice from somebody else. And there are different people to look, look to. Chiropractors are one, but we're not the principal ones as far as it relates to nutritional, nutritional advice. You have naturopathic doctors or doctors of natural medicine. They are probably among the best people um, to speak to about what to do to live a healthy lifestyle, right? If you have a spinal issue, you definitely want to talk to a chiropractor because that's what our training is about, entirely about the spine. And anyone who suggests that a chiropractor is not the person you want to speak to when it comes to a spinal issue, probably doesn't fully understand what chiropractic is about. And if they recommend, and I make no insults to physiotherapy because I want to just make a distinction here. If somebody has a spinal issue, the chiropractor's schooling is principally, primarily, and almost exclusively revolving around treating spinal conditions. Whereas physiotherapy is dealing with therapies, strengthening of muscles, stretching of ligaments or tendons or muscles to um, either reduce a pain somewhere or reduce a spasm somewhere, but it's not necessarily to treat the spine specifically. That's what chiropractors do. So having said all of this multiple, let us get into the meat of the matter. So as it relates to sick care versus health care. The problem principally with sick care or caring for the sick is what I mean by that, caring for the sick, which is what the healthcare system is, is that sick care is reactive. You have to wait until somebody has already gotten sick and if they, get, if, if they have gotten sick, then you can act. You will then be able to diagnose their condition and apply a treatment. But the problem with that is that you have to wait for somebody to get sick. And sometimes when people get sick, they may get sick at a point where they cannot recover from the thing that they've gotten sick from or recovery is limited or, or very difficult. And so rather than waiting for somebody to first get sick, it is better to preempt the illness in the first place. And you do that by being what we call proactive. And what do we mean by being proactive? We mean do something before something else occurs. So you do something in anticipation of and so as to prevent the onset of another thing. So that's what we, we, we talk about when we talk about being proactive. So 
some people say, but wait, wait a minute. When you go to your doctors, can't you be proactive by doing blood work or um, checking your blood pressure or those things? And I need to make a distinction here because you need to understand this clearly. That early detection is still reactive care. Taking your blood pressure checks, taking your lab results, blood work, taking your urine samples and so on. All of those things are looking for whether the person is in the normal range or in a diseased state. If they're in the normal ra range, nothing is done. If they're in a diseased state, meaning that some numbers are out of range, your cholesterol levels are too high, your PSA level is too high, your blood sugar level is too high, your blood pressure value is too high. It is only at that stage that one is able to access any type of intervention. And so you find that even doing those things that are earlier in the detection level, it is still reacting to a problem when it has already occurred. So we want to prevent things from happening before they happen. Now, we have a crisis not just in Jamaica, but we have a crisis in our world. And the crisis is a healthcare crisis. And we're not talking about um, this particular issue that's going on now, this pandemic that's going on now. We're talking about, generally speaking, there is a crisis. And the crisis is, is a crisis of care. For many places, there are more sick people than hospital beds. And the reason that is, is because there are too many ways that people get sick and not enough people are aware of what they need to do to obtain or maintain a state of health or good health. And so most people will get sick. Most people will get very sick at some point in their lives. Um, everyone will die. So what I'm talking about is not about preventing death. What I'm talking about is optimizing your quality of life. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But certainly... Treating people who are in hospitals with drugs and surgeries will be of benefit only if the cause for them being in the hospital is something that requires a chemical solution or a surgical intervention. But the number one reason why people are in the hospitals is because of a lifestyle problem. Lifestyle diseases or lifestyle habits is what lead to diseases for which people get hospitalized for the most part. So taking traumas out of it, right? Taking infections out of it to some degree. It is when persons are constantly, <coughs> constantly exposed to bad choices in their lives, that's when they start to break down and start to require um, medical intervention. So we look at cancer, we look at diabetes, we look at hypertension. Any non-communicable disease is caused principally by a lifestyle choice. Poor lifestyle habits. Now let's look back at an infection now. Infections, for the most part, and this is somewhat controversial if you do not understand how infections work. Infections, for the most part, are caused by poor lifestyle as well. How does that work? We have an immune system, and that immune system is our primary defender against infection. We have other defenders against, our infec against infection, like our skin is one such defense, and our skin is the most important defense strategy to prevent infection. In fact, when somebody goes in the hospital for having received burns to most of their bodies and many and most of the areas of their bodies, the skin has been burnt off and that barrier is no longer there. One of the things that they struggle with in the hospital to keep them alive is to prevent them from developing an, an infection. And that's because your skin, the barrier of your skin, to prevent things from outside in the world from getting into our bodies is the principal way that our immune 
system works to keep us healthy. One of these days, I'm going to try to do a show on the immune system and explain it in, in, in greater detail than what people are exposed to right now because there is so much misinformation going on right now as it relates to our, our, our immune system from persons in the healthcare industry. So much so that the information seems to be toward an end of benefiting the industry itself rather than benefiting the individual. And that is really a sad reality that we are currently facing. So we need to understand how the immune system works because if you fail to understand how the immune system works, then you will constantly believe that our bodies need a vaccine in order to fight infections. And I'll just leave it right there. Because I'd like to have a show this time next month as well. I don't want anybody to shut us off. So let's move forward, shall we? There are two ways of thinking, and when it comes to our health, there are two ways of thinking. One is according to a model we call the illness care model, and the other way is according to the wellness care model. The illness care model is when we're looking at um, the illness care model is when we're looking at the way we are taught to think by the mainstream media. And I, I'm going to try my best not to go down any conspiracy theory type roads, okay? Try to keep it as above board as possible and in a way that's logical as possible. Now, have you ever heard of a captive audience? Yes, and it's, 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 it's not a pun. It's, it's, a, it's a literal expression whereby people who watch TV or watch social media now or engage on their phones, they are captive audience. They are, they are almost held, held captive by their devices for several hours a day. And the primary way that people make money on these persons who are held captive is by advertising. The more money you're able to spend on advertising is the more um, your the more face time that your captive audience will have of your products or services. Well, as it is, the number one spender or the people who spend the most on advertising happens to be the pharmaceutical industry. So much so that almost every single news, major news network is heavily sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. And when I say sponsored, it's not in the sense that they just sponsor them, but their revenue comes primarily from their biggest advertisers and they are the biggest advertisers by far. And so you'll find that most of the information that is shared to the general public as it pertains to the pharmaceutical industry is not just positive but glowing information about their products and services. So how can you expect a media house to say anything negative about the company that provides 60% of their revenue. You can't. You can't simply expect that and it does not happen. So if you do not know that, you need to know because that is, that is very important. But let's get on with it because I want you to understand how the two ways that people think. I want to run through these quickly because they are similar but important. The first way is if somebody is sick, the first thing that people try to do is they want to take something to feel better because they're taught that if they have an illness, then they need to take a pill or a lotion or a potion to feel better, some medicines to ingest or something to put on their skin so that they can feel better. They have a headache, I want to take some Excedrin or whatever to feel a little better. And I understand people don't like suffering. But the problem is that if your goal is simply to feel better, there you can guarantee, be guaranteed that there is somebody who is going to make a product that is able to make you feel better 
so that they can sell that product to you, whether or not it makes you any better whatsoever. And the reality is that that's how the, 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 the world is of healthcare. Many of the interventions can help you in the short term to feel a little better, but in the long term, you continue in your state of illness. And that's not cool. Well, the wellness way of thinking is rather than simply saying, what can I take to feel better? You can ask, what do I need to do in order to get better? Because getting better is far more valuable than simply wanting to just feel better. Now, many people have used this expression before. Sometimes they use it when somebody's in the hospital, a loved one is sick, or a family member or a friend is sick, and they go to visit them in the hospital. And they send them a card that says, get well soon. Well, get well soon is nothing more than wishful thinking. In other words, there is no action, there is no will behind it. It is just a desire. You're hoping, you're desiring, you're wishing that the person will achieve a state of good health, considering that they're currently sick. You're not saying... I wish you will get well soon by getting out of the bed and starting to eat some vegetables and take drinking some green juice and some green teas and doing some detox. You're not thinking in that way. You're not thinking about things to do. You're thinking about a wish. At least I do when I use that expression, right? But the whole issue of wellness is not about getting to a state of wellness as if Wellness is about the destination. Wellness is not about the destination. Wellness is entirely about the journey. And so rather than simply saying, I want to get well, you need to start asking, what do I need to do in order to stay well? Because staying well is way more valuable than simply getting well. If you get well and you continue with your lifestyle as it had been before when you were sick, you're going to be sick very quickly thereafter again. How long do you expect to remain in that state? You have to do things differently in order to maintain that state. So staying well is more important. And they also have a situation where persons want to stay alive um, and staying alive becomes their goal. We understand why staying alive is their goal because we are taught that that's what we need to do. Have persons stay alive as long as possible. And if somebody dies earlier than somebody else, then we assume that that person was sicker. So you need to understand this very important point about life and death. Life and death is controlled not by us and our choices, but by God and his sovereignty. It is God who decides who lives and who dies, when they live and when they die. Not the choices that we make per se. There are many people who eat very poorly and they will outlive many people who eat very healthily. You can eat very well and get struck by lightning or get hit by a car or get a staph infection or something and it kills you or contract some, some disease even though you're healthy and it kills you. There are many people who have terminal situations but are living pretty healthy lifestyles but they will die before you. Living a healthy lifestyle does not guarantee that you will live a long time. But what it almost certainly guarantees is that you will not be in a disease state for very long. And that's the difference, is that when people are in a disease state, oftentimes they suffer for years before they eventually die. It's like a candle that's slowly flickering, 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 and the flame is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and it takes a long time before it is finally extinguished. Versus the person who is healthy, whose flame is burning bright until somebody blows out your candles. And it can happen in a myriad of ways. It doesn't have to be somebody else. It could be your, you know, something that happened to you um, just as a happenstance. So please understand, staying alive is not about um, eating well or what have you, right? But having the quality of life is more important. 
And so rather than simply wanting to live for a very long time, we need to make sure that we are living the highest quality of life possible. Not suffering with pain and, and, and discomfort and aches and what have you, weakness and, you know, but living a life whereby you are able to experience all the beauties and complexities that life has to offer and deprive yourself of nothing that life has to offer you. And that is what I'm hoping for. So simply put, we're going to go through them again and look at the very close association between the illness care model and the wellness care model. Feel better, get well, stay alive is an illness care model. But if you want to have true wellness, you have to think differently. You have to think in terms of how can I get better? What do I need to do in order to get better? How do I need to live my life in order to stay well? And how can I make choices to ensure that I am feeling alive in all areas of my life? So feel, get, stay becomes get, stay, feel. Now, here is an interesting one, and it's the truth about pain. And the question is, is pain a good thing or a bad thing? And there are many people who ask this question, is pain a good thing or a bad thing? Um, whether it's good or bad is not the important point as it deals with pain. Because there are a lot of people who believe it's good, a lot of people who believe it's bad. But one thing we all can agree on is that there's a purpose to pain. And what's the purpose? The purpose is that pain alerts us that something has changed and requires our attention. That's the purpose of pain. But what's the problem with pain? Because there is a problem. And many people don't understand that there is a problem. In fact, what separates the human from the animal? Very important point. What separates a human from any other animal who does not have that higher level thinking is that all animals are governed or their decisions are based on pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain. Pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. And I will dare suggest you may think I'm, uh, you may disagree with me, but I dare suggest that if you live your life whereby it is primarily driven by pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain, you are limiting the beauty of your humanity because there is so much greater in store for us than simply living in this way. So we might actually make a decision. We might see a baby who is in a building. This baby has nothing to do with us. This baby is somebody else's child. And we might climb the side of a building to try to save or rescue a baby that is dangling from a ledge. Or... We will try to run into a building to try to save a baby in a burning house. Or uh, we might try to go into a burning vehicle to pull out a young child or an old lady or somebody without thinking or re having regard for our own health or our own safety. Why would we risk pain and life for somebody else? That's because human beings have the propensity to act beyond Pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain. And there's many debates. There are many people who can debate that one, but that's not the point of tonight, right? Let's live above that. But there is a problem with pain. And what's the problem with pain? You can't trust pain because pain is limited in what it can tell you. Having good health is not synonymous with feeling good. So if you feel good, if you're not having any pain and you're feeling healthy, that doesn't mean you're healthy. Feeling healthy does not mean that you're healthy. Look how many people, they feel perfectly fine, and then when they go to their doctors, they find out that they have very high blood pressure. Yet they were feeling fine. 
This is why they call blood pressure, by the way, the silent killer. Because there are oftentimes no symptoms associated with high blood pressure, certainly not in the early stages. Cancers. There are many people walking around with cancers right now, undiagnosed cancer. Why? Because they, they're not having any pain whatsoever. And their cancers that they have will not be diagnosed for another year, two years, five years, or maybe even 10 years. Because cancers can take 10 to 15 years to develop within a person before it gets to a size that's large enough to be detected by most of our most sensitive equipment. So you need to understand that choices that we make in life are so very, very critical. Continuing. Good health is equal to healthy function. If you want to have good health, then you have to make sure that your body is functioning well. If it is functioning well, then you have a chance. So we need to start trusting how our body works and not just how our body feels. Trust our function, not our feeling. And so when you look at this one in particular, what we're seeing here, and I'm going to just try to remove these things that are probably blocking the view. And what's, what we see is this. Our immune system, these are the systems of the body. The immune system, the digestive system, cardiovascular system, integumentary, which is our skin and coverings, respiratory, endocrine, which is our hormone systems, reproductive system, you know those, excretory system, musculoskeletal, and the nervous system. These are the different systems of the body. And these systems are essential for our bodies to work. And not only is it essential for our bodies to be able to work, but these systems must work together for our bodies to work properly. And so the question remains, how does one system know what to do so as to be in step with another system? How does one system cooperate in such a way to support the role of another system? Well, in order for this symphony to occur, just like when you look at a, an orchestra, you will see all these amazing, individually talented musicians. But if you say to them, play, and they all just started to play. It doesn't matter how beautifully each person is playing. The overall sound can result in discord if they're not playing together. And this is how the body is. It doesn't matter how good each individual system is. If they're not working together, the body will not produce good music, so to speak. And so how does this work? What acts as the great conductor for the human body or for any living body. The conductor in our case is the one that we consider to be the master control system. And there's one of these systems whose role it is to not only govern but regulate the role and function of all the other systems of the body and help them to mutually work together. Which system is this? Who can tell us the name of that system? It's the nervous system. The nervous system is that master control system. And if you look carefully at the nervous system, you will see that there are many organs associated with the nervous system. And these organs that are associated with the nervous system they are connected to the spine by way of nerves. Every single organ, you'll see these blue lines, this blue set of lines here that goes to the spine, 
these yellow lines that you see here that go to the spine, all of those make up what is called nerves that control the function of the different organs as a part of our nervous system. Very, very important. Very, very important. But as we look forward, let's pay attention to this here because the nervous system is considered the mass control system. If you have a bone in the spine that's out of alignment with the other bones, it can affect these nerves. Because the nerves of the spine, which are a part of the nervous system, the nervous system's major organs are the brain on top and the spinal cord in the middle. But from the spinal cord coming out on either side are the nerves. And these nerves control the functions of the body. Now, if you have a bone, if you have a bone that's out of alignment with the others, it can affect the function of these nerves. And I'll show you how in a second. But we call this a vertebral subluxation is when the spine is no longer lined up with each other, but they have not shifted from each other so much so as to dislocate the joints that they are attached by. So a vertebral subluxation can interfere with the nerves and thereby cause nervous system dysfunction. And I'm going to show you something here, and hopefully this makes sense to you, that if you look at this chart, you will see that the, the middle bone is not lined up with the other bones. That middle bone here is pushed inward. And as it is pushed in, you see these yellow bands here, these are the nerves that are coming out. But this red one is also a nerve, and the reason we color it red is because the opening, which is in the back here, like right here, is an opening. That's where the nerves exit through those openings. Well, if you push the bone out of alignment, look what happens to the opening in the back. You will end up closing off that opening, and that will result in something that we call a pinched nerve. But sometimes the bones will not displace that significantly so as to create this pinched nerve because of the pressure of the bone. Most of the times, it might be another component of the spine that ends up causing the pinched nerve, which in this case, the cartilage is the one of the more common offenders. Whenever your cartilage is out of alignment or your cartilage gets displaced, we call it a slip disc loosely. And a slip disc, if it presses on the nerve, will cause the nerves to no longer work the way they are supposed to work. Now, can you see what's happening here? As this bone is shifted and this nerve is compressed, the question is, what if this nerve is responsible to regulate the function of the heart, the beating of the heart? Because there are nerves that control the rate of the heartbeat. Now, these nerves are not necessarily nerves that travel through the spine directly but nerves do control the rate of the heart and if you interfere with those nerves you may interfere with the rate of the heart now there are two nerves that govern the rate of the heart one that will speed up the rate and one that will slow down the rate the nerve that slows down the rate is a part of a nerve called the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve does not travel through the spine so usually you will find that people with a spinal problem if it affects their heart, it does not make their heart beat slower. Bradycardia is usually not caused by a spinal issue. However, if somebody had a whiplash accident and it affected the nerves in their cervical spine or their neck region, then the nerves that leave the spine in the neck region, they do control the rate of the heart, but those nerves will speed up the heart. And so if you irritate those nerves, those nerves will cause a rapid, a, rapid, a rapidity of the heartbeat, right? 
got a little tongue twisted there for a second, right? But it will cause a, cause a rapid beating of the hand. And so there are a lot of people who have had whiplash accidents and they later describe or report that they've been having some heart palpitations where they feel that their heart is like beating out of their chest or beating rapidly for no apparent reason other than because the nerve that controls the rate of the heart is overstimulated because of the injury from the whiplash. And many people don't even realize that they are having an injury from that situation. So, am I making sense? Um, please make sure you put a comment because I want to make sure that we're making sense, all right? I want to make sure we're understanding. We're getting here. We're rounding to the end now. So, key number four is about stresses in our lives. We talk about subluxations being misalignment in the vertebrae. Well, there's a figurative subluxation that can happen in our lives as well where our lives are no longer in alignment. And if our lives are no longer in alignment, well, stresses will oftentimes cause our lives to no longer be in alignment. And so people who have stresses may end up having problems in their system. And there are different types of problems and different types or ways in which these problems will impact persons. So let's look at it this way now, right? There are three types of stressors that we are exposed to, generally speaking, as a category. The first is the physical. And with a physical stressor, this is like a car accident, a fall, something that impacts our physical bodies, physically. There's also biochemical stressors or chemical stressors. And these chemical stressors are things that are chemical in nature that will impact our health. And what are these things that are chemical in nature that can impact our health? How about a cigarette? That's chemical in nature. How about medications? Those are chemicals. How about um, the, the quality of the water that we drink or the quality of the food that we eat? Those things are all examples of biochemical stressors that can impact our health. Psychological stressors include things like a stressful job, a boss that is constantly in your skin, night in, night out, day in, day out. And when this happens, it will impact significantly your quality of life and your ability to fight disease and maintain health. So bear that in mind, all right? Now, the healthier our nervous systems are, the better able we are to adapt to our environmental stresses. And this is true. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an old person fall. I'm going to try to just kind of shift here, right, for a moment. An old person might fall. An old person might fall in such a way that if you watch them fall, watch what may happen. Normally, if you see a baby or an infant or a child falling, as soon as their bodies start to tilt and they, are, they have lost their balance, as soon as their body has tilted to the point where they are going to fall or they may fall, immediately there are strategies that they employ to prevent the fall. Their hands will shoot out. There will be that startle response. They'll grab out for things. They'll stretch out their arms. They do different things before they even have tilted very far over. But sometimes I've seen very old people fall. And it is scary to watch an old person fall. I, I've seen old people fall in such a way that you see them tilting, 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 tilting. And there is absolutely zero response by them until after 
boom, they hit the floor. And it's only after they hit the ground that you may see them do a startle. It's not because they are, you know, just slower to react by stretching out. That's not why you see them delayed in stretching out. It's because they are slower to identify the fact that they're even falling. So they'll be tilting over and even while they're falling, they don't even realize that they have lost their balance and are going down. This is why for older persons, you have to keep your spinal, your, your nervous system as healthy as possible. Because when your nervous system fails to act properly, you are at greater risk of injury and death. And your nervous system is intimately tied to the health of your spine. Intimately. And so you want to make sure you preserve that. All right? So let's continue, shall we? Why do we get sick? Why do people get sick? Persons get sick because their bodies can no longer adapt to their environmental changes. As long as you can successfully adapt to changes in your environment, you don't break down, you don't get sick. But if you fail to be able to adapt, that's when sickness starts to take over. And so watch carefully. I'm going to use this analogy here um, to explain what we call our gap, which is our general adaptive potential. It's our ability to adapt to our environmental stresses. Please pay attention. This is important, right? So watch now carefully. This is why we get sick. If we think of our coping mechanism as being a gap, every gap will have a an upper limit, but a lower limit, and every gap will have an upper limit, where the space between them represents the gap. The wider the gap is the healthier you are, the narrower your gap is the sicker you are. The wider it is, is the more that upper limit is approaching what we call vitality. And as your upper limit starts to fall and approach death, that's when you become sick, easier. So the wider your gap is, the healthier you are. The narrower your gap, the sicker you are. Now, there are certain things that will press down on our upper limit and make us more likely to have a narrower gap. What are those things? The ES of our lives, our external stresses, or our environmental stressors. These are the things that will impact us and cause our upper limit to start to fall. The only resistance that we have against this up downward pressure is our internal resistance. Our internal resistance, our internal ability to oppose these forces is what enables to us to remain in a good state of health. But our internal resistance is 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 affected or controlled by choices that we make. So if you're not sleeping adequately, then your resistance will fall. If you're not resting adequately, your resistance will fall. If you're not drinking adequately, your resistance will fall. If you're eating too many things that contain sugars, your resistance will fall. It is when your resistance falls that you break down and you get sick. And so look at this here. As long as our life experiences exist within the boundaries of our gaps, we do not break down. Our bodies can adapt to everything that our environment throws at us. But if we cause our upper limit to start to drop, and as our upper limit falls and settles at a lower height, then there might become points in our environment that now exceed our ability to cope with them. For some families, it might be cancers. For some families, it might be um, diabetes. And so these are choices that are made to, well, these are situations that affect individuals based on their individual makeup. 
if your family is predisposed to cancer, for example, or your family is predisposed to diabetes, then it is important that you do not live in the same manner that your family lives. In other words, you can't eat the same kind of foods, drink the same kind of drinks, do the same kinds of things and expect a different outcome for you. You have to raise your levels above where theirs was to protect yourself. Let us apply this situation to germs, for example, and this thing that we call COVID or what have you, right? There's really nothing very special about COVID as a as, as a disease per se, because there are many infectious diseases that can kill us. Many, many, many. If you leave them unchecked. Things like meningitis. If you develop meningitis, it can kill you. Things like gastroenteritis. If you develop gastroenteritis, it can kill you. There are many people who die because of gastroenteritis. There are many people who die because of some other respiratory infection that led to pneumonia. But the types of people who die typically fall into a similar category. These are the persons who have multiple illnesses. And if you have multiple illnesses, what does that say about the width of your gap? It's already very narrow. And if your gap is narrow, then when you're exposed to something that can harm you, it will. When you're exposed to something that can make you very sick, it will. So the question is, how do you best treat a situation like what we are in today? Do we treat it by trying to... Um, take medications of different types to prevent us from getting sick because of the medication? Do we respond by trying to build our internal resistance so that our gap remains as wide as possible? How best do we approach this situation? If you have a barrage of things coming at you. You can try to block them individually. Block them individually is like saying that somebody is shooting darts at you and you're given a cup to catch the darts when they are thrown. To catch the darts when they are thrown. You are given a cup. Do I have any cups here? No, I do not have any cups here. But you get it. Catch the darts when they are thrown. This is how it is when you are treating individual diseases. It's like you are taking a cup and trying to catch each dart that is thrown. But there's a better way than catching darts. If somebody is throwing darts at you and you can't get out of the way, then the best thing you can do is put up a big enough barrier that covers your entire being. That it doesn't matter where they throw the dart, this barrier will protect you no matter where the dart is thrown, and you don't have to keep moving the barrier around because this barrier covers your entire being. Do we have any such barriers that covers our entire being that would be better served building or erecting rather than trying to catch each individual dart by looking at each individual treatment? The answer is yes. 
the obvious one, which is our immune system. Our immune system is designed to protect us from infections. It is designed to protect us from foreign agents. That is how it is designed. Who designed our immune system this way? Natural selection? Oh, no. God designed it this way. And we can enter that argument another time about um, evolution or, this, or creation. We can enter that argument another time. But I have the floor, so I'm going to share what I understand from the science. And the proper use of science shows that there was design in the human body or in any body, for example, for, for that matter. And so with this grand design, we have our immune system, which is designed to protect us from infection. Question one, if we are exposed to a pathogen that can infect us, How likely are we to die? Well, for the most part, almost you can almost find, almost always find somebody that will succumb to almost any infection that's out there. It doesn't matter how faint it is. You can almost always find one person that anything can kill that one person. But you also have other people for whom you can throw at them any infection whatsoever and they do not get sick. You can throw anthrax, you can throw um, botulism, you can throw E. coli, you can throw H. pylori, you can throw measles, you can throw all these things at them and guess what? They might not even display many symptoms. But if they do display symptoms, it's temporary symptoms while the body learns about the disease, builds the immune response, and destroys it. That's the power of a proper working immune system. And the immune system is so powerful that if it's working adequately, we cannot get sick with these so-called viruses or bacteria that are out there. We get sick when we're compromised. We get sick when we're compromised. And there are many ways that the immune system works, but I'm going to teach you one way that the immune system is never designed to work. The immune system is, is designed to work by way of things that we breathe into our nostrils. Our nostrils are lined on our upper respiratory tract, are lined with mucus and cells within the mucus, uh, mucus membranes that are immune cells, that when a pathogen gets into our nostrils or into our upper respiratory tract, these immune system cells will recognize them and immediately start to kill them. Not only that, they will communicate with other immune cells that will now take a mental picture of these things that invaded us and to build other defenses to prevent them from ever infecting us again should we encounter it again. Everybody thinks that these are um, antibodies, but no, it is not the antibodies that are the principal rep um, repository of memory against an infection. What helps us to remember an infection are, is what is known as a memory B cell or a memory T cells. It is these memory cells that are important to fight infection, not the antibodies. Now, this is how it works. An infection comes in. Our body recognizes it for the first time. It will make an attack, launch an attack against it through what is called the innate immunity, which doesn't care what comes in. It will kill anything that comes in. Natural killer cells, white blood cells, eosinophils, basophils. These are white blood cells that attack anything that comes in that's, that's foreign. But then you have another part of your, your system, um, your, 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 your lymphocytes will now engulf things, your white blood cells, and they will 
chew up these proteins and make them available for your bodies to recognize these different proteins and make antibodies against them. But not only do they make antibodies, they also make these memory cells. The antibodies are there to help in the fight currently. But after the fight is over, your antibody levels will drop. Why does your antibody levels drop? Because antibodies are proteins. And if you keep on making proteins in your bloodstream for every infection, and you keep building more and more antibodies in your bloodstream, your blood will become too thick to circulate. So the antibodies that are on board are there for a short duration in the volume or the quantity that we would normally see right after an infection. After the infection is over, then your antibody levels over the next several weeks to months will start to wane. It does not mean your immune system is now vulnerable again. Because remember, it's not the antibodies that, that are important. What is important is the memory cells because you have two types of memory cells, your memory B cells and your memory T cells. Your memory T cells will become a part of your defense against any cell that becomes infected in your body in the future by a particular pathogen. And your memory B cell will respond to any infection in your bloodstream. And the way it responds to that is that it is your, it is your memory B cells that make antibodies. So once you have made your antibodies, your antibodies have fought the fight and are now declining, your memory B cells will go to your bone marrow and they will wait in your bone marrow and your spleen. And they will wait there for the next infection. When the next infection occurs, your bone marrow will help in the making of your new antibodies and it makes those antibodies rapidly so in the matter of hours you will have a new production of antibodies there ready to fight this new infection that you are exposed to again having been exposed to it before so people keep talking about oh well after you got this infection this current one your antibody levels yeah they'll be there for a time but then their antibody levels will wait this is a misapplication and misinformation as it pertains to how the immune system works. Please, if anyone would like to challenge me on this, you are welcome to challenge me on this. My information is online. You can find me by just shooting an email to Dr. Neil Gardner at gcnjamaica.com and cite your references. Don't just tell me your opinion or give me your qualifications. Cite your references that documents that some other position is the truth. Yeah? And then we'll take it from there. So, yeah, it pains me to see what's happening in our world because I see how we are being taken advantage of and people are being um, forced into making decisions from, from a fear standpoint instead of a knowledge standpoint. And the unfortunate thing is that those who are supposed to be providing knowledge and information are instead providing misinformation to their end and that is sad that is sad okay chiropractic the healthier nervous system is a better way able to adapt to our stresses and chiropractic improves the function of our nervous system as we indicated earlier by realigning the bones of the spine and allowing less irritation of the nerves that exit. By extension, chiropractic, since it improves nervous system function, can widen our gap. However, chiropractic is not the only thing required to widen our gap. Remember, we talked about internal resistance. Chiropractic should be a part of our internal resistance um, armory. It is not the only tool or weapon that we have. We need to also be doing other things like eating a particular way, resting adequately, drinking enough water, clean water, um, so as to ensure that our bodies have all the tools to fight whatever comes our way. If somebody's already sick, if somebody's already compromised, 
and they have very little resistance, maybe it's better for them to take some medication to help their situation. Maybe it is better, provided that the medication actually does what they say it does, right? Um, so I'm not talking about that. But what I am talking about is this. Everyone has a responsibility to ensure that their health and the health of their loved ones is at as high a level as possible so as to prevent themselves from becoming succumb or from succumbing to any type of life experience that is potentially life-threatening. You need to make choices. You need to stop living a lie. Many people live a lie. Many people are obese and they don't recognize that they're, they're, they're living, they're, they're ticking time bomb. But it's not just obese people. There are many people who are thin that are ticking time bombs just the same. You have to make sure that you're doing the things that are required for health. And what's given to us for health? Plants, fruits, vegetables. That's what's given to us for health. Our plants and fruits are given as food. The herbs and spices are given as medicine. That is the correct order of things. Now, man has come along and man has synthesized chemicals from these herbs and through their training of whomever, they tell people that now these chemicals are better than the herbs because you can now measure the precise amount. But no, that's nonsense because herbs contain not only that particular active ingredient that they've now patented, but herbs contain other nutrients that work in synergy with that active ingredient to bring about the best possible change. And that's why no one can convince me otherwise until they are willing to show me the double-blind clinical trials where they used herbs appropriately and compare it to any medication and show that the medication is better than the appropriate herb from which the medication was derived. Show me that study or those studies and I will concede publicly. Second to last, we talked about subluxations being the things that cause um, our bodies to break down, right? Well, we identify them in our office through cutting edge technology, either by rolling this thing on the back, which is which we call a rolling thermal scan. It measures the temperature of the skin on either side of the spine. And on the right hand side, we're looking at these paddles that measure muscle tension. So we can tell whether or not somebody truly has a muscle spasm in their spine by using this electromyography. Um, it's not as precise as a needle EMG. This is a surface EMG, but it gets the job done. If there are spinal issues, we can help persons make wiser choices to correct these spinal issues. What kind of doctor is a chiropractor? Well, if chiropractors truly do what they say they do and we help the nervous system as we claim that we do, then what we will understand from it is that there must be some way of demonstrating a change in the nervous system through the adjustment. And this study that was done demonstrates just that. So watch carefully. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit so that persons can see what we're talking about. So, here we are looking at A before and after picture of a human brain, the brain of a woman that was asked to perform a task, and then she was adjusted and the task repeated. The task was 
for her to simply wiggle her left ankle. And by wiggling her left ankle, they took a picture of her brain. And what and this is what we call a functional MRI. And what we see is multiple areas of lights all over her brain. These areas of lights are areas where the brain is active. This brain is active in places where it should not be active. So for this person, her brain was not communicating effectively and efficiently with her body. She was given an adjustment to her cervical spine, her neck, and the task repeated, and this is what we saw, areas of activity in fewer areas of the brain. Fewer areas of the brain. And these areas now actually coincide with where we would expect to see action to generate movement in the left side of the body. And so what we have seen is that an adjustment of the spine affected the function of the brain and how the brain saw the body. And there are many different studies that have been done over the years whereby we can now see how, how the spine does what it does. By way of the adjustment, that is, and how the chiropractic adjustment makes such a difference to the health of individuals. Now, if people want to ask, what kind of doctor is a chiropractor? Please, a chiropractor is not a bone doctor. We are nervous system doctors because our work does not impact the bones so much as they impact the function of the nerves. And that's the importance of what we do. I'm a chiropractic neurologist, which means that we have some specialties. Um, and just like every other health professionals, uh, we have some specialties within our field. And these subspecialties include pediatrics, neurology, general chiropractic, um, internists, chiropractic, chiropractic internists. There are many different types of chiropractors. Um, and the essential thing about a chiropractor is that a chiropractor tries to find non-medicinal ways of addressing different health issues. And so we find non-medicinal ways to address neurological situations wherever it's appropriate to do so because it's not always appropriate. Sometimes medical collaboration or intervention is absolutely necessary. So I hope you understand that when it is appropriate to work alongside our medical counterparts, it is for your best interest that we do so and we gladly do that because working in isolation cannot make sense because not every problem is a chiropractic problem. And by the same token, not every problem is a medication problem or a surgery problem. We need each other. We need to work together as a holistic unit by which the allopathic physician, the medical doctor, should be a part of that holistic medicine. We talk about holistic medicine and we talk about it in the sense of excluding it from the medical practitioner, but that's wrong. The medical doctor, the chiropractor, the naturopath, the acupuncturist, the other Chinese medicine doctors, the Ayurvedic specialists, all these other specialties and all these other allied health practitioners are a part of a holistic approach to health. We all have to work together. Nobody has a monopoly on health. Nobody. We each deal with a particular aspect of health. And if we work together, guess who benefits? The patients. You benefit. These are some conditions that I've personally worked with. Um, with our chiropractic neurology program to varying degrees of success. Some almost miraculous, some, some are just nice. But not everybody gets better, so that's important to point out as well. Like I said, not everybody's a case, right? Um, we have a vision here at Gardner Chiropractic and Neurology, and it's threefold. One is to identify subluxations wherever and whenever 
they are occurring by our technology that we have employed to provide a program of chiropractic care that is appropriate for each person to address their specific need. And if you have 10 people come to me, it is quite possible for all 10 of them to have a slightly different treatment approach if they have 10 different situations going on. The same approach can't work for everybody. You have to try to tailor make the approach for the individual. And that's what we try to do. Um, and we educate our community. And this class that we're having here is one such way that we've done that. So the final key is this. The key to success in getting and staying well is for us to take responsibility for our health and well-being. That is the key to success. We have to take responsibility. It is our health. It is our well-being being we need to take responsibility for our health and well-being. Very important. If you're watching on our YouTube page, um, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Very important to subscribe. Because by subscribing, you are able to, if we post something, if I go live at any time, it will send you an alert. So click the notification icon as well, the bell icon, along with the subscription button, um, so you can watch us, right? We have a playlist of testimonials. Be sure to check those out. Um, I, admittedly, they are old. I try not to do too many of them these days because it creates such a demand for office that we are unable to um, service persons in a timely fashion. And so we end up with people waiting inordinately long periods of time. And I do apologize for that. If you're a patient or you're a prospective patient um, and you are trying to get an appointment and you realize that the appointment time is long in coming, please, I apologize for that. It's because we are somewhat oversubscribed at the moment, but hopefully in some time in the near future, we'll be able to get some assistance for what we're doing and we can be able to spread the work around and get people in and treated in a more timely fashion. All right? So be sure to pay attention to those. So we have a special offer for those of you who have tuned in with us tonight. We have a very special offers. offer. So there's a question. How can a person with cerebellum degen degeneration be proactively be proactive regarding their wellness? That's a beautiful question. I'm going to try to answer that question, um, Patricia, right? Because there are things that can be done. Um, so just to get back to it though, we have a special offer for you. If you are an existing patient, yours is, your offer is coming up next, but if you are a new patient, meaning that you have not yet come in for your new patient exam, then you'll be given just by being a part of this presentation, all you have to do, you will send an email to appointments at gcnjamaica.com. Send your emails to appointments at gcnjamaica.com and someone will be able to assist you in making your appointment and making sure that you get your discount. All right, just make sure you mention that you are part of this lecture. If you do not send this information, they will not know that you are part of the class to be able to give you this discount, but they will be able to check our chat section and only those names who appear in the chat 
will be able to qualify for this discount. So if you are hoping to take advantage of this 40% discount, make sure that your name is registered in the chat so that when you send your email and we check back the records, your information is there. All right. And if you are an existing patient, then what we have for you is more than for those who are new patients. Not only will you get a 20% discount off your update exam, knowing that the update exam is almost the same cost of the new, as the new exam, but you will also get a 20% discount off one treatment per person that you refer. So if you refer five people, then you will get a 20% discount of five people. That's five times you will receive a 20% discount. Or you can receive all five 20% discounts of the same um, treatment, thereby having a free treatment. But it's one 20% discount per treatment or per person that you refer. Can be applied in any way that you choose, to any treatment that you choose. And finally, you'll get a 10% discount off your entire next phase of care. Most people who come to us and we do a series of treatments, we do it in phases. We start off initially to see if what we're doing is able to help and if it is helping, um, by how much is it able to help. This is where we do your update examination. But after the update examination, if it turns out that we are helping, and that you're desiring to do further treatment to get further help, um, then we will do a 10% discount of the entire next phase of care. And a phase of care typically is 12 visits. So for the 12 visits phase of care, you will get 10% discount of 12 treatments plus whatever the update examination fee would have been. And so by virtue of that, that 10% discount is actually more money saved by a dollar amount than this 40% discount. But please be sure to send your information via appointments at gcnjamaica.com. gcnjamaica.com. All right. So I am very grateful to all of you for having participated. I'm excited for you. Um, I look forward to partnering with, with you, not all of you, but some of you certainly, as it relates to trying to take care of your health. We'll do the best that we can um, to ensure that you enjoy yourselves and enjoy your time here with us as a practice, but not just enjoying yourselves, but having significant improvement in your situation. That's what we're working towards. So may God bless and keep you. If you have any questions for me, I'm going to try to stick around for about five minutes after I close off. And um, I'm about to um, just shift over back to some music. And I'll, what I will do is I will type in my responses in the chat. Because that, I find, is the fastest way to respond to you. Because when you send a, a message via chat, it's instant. But if I respond in the video, then there's a long delay. So as soon as you send a message in the chat, I'm going to respond in the chat so that you get the response as quickly as possible. God bless you richly. And thank you so much for joining us tonight we went way way over but i did not want to stop because i felt like we were on a roll and getting somewhere i've mentioned some things that are for some of you it may seem controversial um and that's because you know you've been hearing different things you don't have to trust what i say and i'm not asking you to trust me over trusting other persons right because you have to trust somebody. And if you trust what you're being told by others, then trust them. 
If you want to trust what I say, then trust what I say. But what I would encourage you to do is to investigate how the immune system works. It's, I can't simply just say do your own research because what does that mean? How do you know what to look for, right? So what I'm going to ask you to do is this. Look up research articles on how the immune system works or research articles on the safety of a medication or research articles on the safety of a procedure or the safety of a vaccine, whatever it is. Look up the research articles because it is these articles that have to be peer-reviewed, meaning that colleagues in the field have to get a chance to review them before they are fully published. So these are very important. This is, the, this is what we call a primary source. And when you're getting it from somebody like me, at best, I'm secondary or tertiary. If I have read the article myself and some of these articles for the things that I've commented on, I've read myself. So I'm a secondary source because I have read the primary source myself. But I have also gotten reports from persons who've read the primary source. So that makes me now a tertiary source. The further removed you are from the primary source is the less reliable you are. And news media is by far the least reliable source when it comes to anything scientific or anything medicinal. It is by far the least reliable source. What's not as bad as um, news articles or news reports will be a textbook. But by the time a textbook is published and used in a school or used in education, it's like nine years or 10 years removed from when the primary research was done for which the information, from which the information was derived that went into the, into the textbook. And so many people believe that a textbook on a subject is the best source. And the answer is no. The primary source is a research article. And there are different types of research articles. Some of them are randomized clinical trials where nobody knows what, who the subject is and who the, the test subject is, who the control is. There's a control and all these things. You have random, randomized trials, but you also have different types of um, primary studies like review articles and other things that compare other articles that have been put together and published and provide um, expository information on them. So lots of information there. I hope you found this time useful. I hope you benefit from it. And I thank you for your patience. And if you want to stick around with me for the next five minutes and ask any questions that you have of me, feel free to go ahead and ask. I will try to answer them before I hang up. May God bless and keep you and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day.
slowly closing Trying hard but you wanna be my friend In a place to hide and no one to run to Here we go, here we go again Call my bluff, I'ma be here till the end I'm the one you ride, I'm the one you 